dilemma was I, I created this persona. I wasn't writing the advice column as Steve Almond. I was writing as somebody named Sugar. And Sugar, in my mind, in my imagination, was a woman of a certain age, probably in her late 30s or 40s, who'd had a very eventful life and was wise and irreverent and no bull. And that worked kind of badly because it was fake. And then something very curious happened. I received a fan letter. In fact, I think it was the only fan letter that I received. And this was toward the end of my run as Sugar. And I was looking for somebody to replace me. And the fan letter was fascinating because it was from the very person that I had been thinking was probably Sugar. Do you remember sending me that email? <laughs> I do. I remember... I was an avid reader of the column, and you didn't write it You were as the often. avid reader. There was one, and it was you. <laughs> I'm sure that's not true. But you didn't write it as often as I wanted you to, and that's what compelled me to, to write to you. I, I didn't know who Sugar was, and so I was a little bit afraid to write that letter. I knew in my email you would see my name, but I wouldn't see yours. That's right. And that came through very clearly in the email, which was very sweet, but also said, well, you know, I feel a little uncomfortable sending you this because you're sugar. I'm just me. And then it was signed Cheryl Strayed. And I thought, but Cheryl Strayed, you don't realize that you're actually sugar. And I'm just about to ask you to become sugar because I had read your beautiful novel, Torch. But more to the point, I'd read some of your nonfiction and I was blown away and reading on the page who you are and how quick you are to the truth and how compassionate you are with it. I thought this is the person who's sugar. And then what did I do, Cheryl? Well, some time passed and I got an email from you and you said, OK, I'm done with it. Would you like to take it over? Yes. <laughs> Could Which, you please show me what I was trying to do? And so I said yes, but there was also then, once I gave you my initial yes, we involved two people in the conversation. Stephen Elliott, the founder of The Rumpus, yes. and Isaac Fitzgerald, who was the managing editor of The Rumpus. Right. And why don't we call Stephen? Yeah, he's a freak. Let's call him. Hello? Stephen Elliott, you're talking to the Sugars. Hi. Hey, Sugars. Hey, Stevens. Listen, we were reminiscing about that wonderful historical moment when I said, hey, you need to have Cheryl Strayed write the Dear Sugar column because she's awesome and I kind of suck and I'm tired of it. Do you remember that? <laughs> I do remember that. We didn't know each other. Did you? Had you ever even heard of me at that point? Uh, I want to say yes, but that would be a lie. <laughs> I know, because you, you sent me a note saying, like, can she do this? And I was like, oh, my God, of course she can do this. <laughs> yeah. No, there was definitely a moment where I was like, oh, this is completely different. This is totally original and amazing and unlike anything any of us have ever experienced in an advice column. For me, anyway, the, the point where you found yourself and found the voice of the column was the baby bird. Yeah. You know, where you get this question from some callow young guy who's saying, WTF, WTF, WTF. I'm asking this question as it applies to everything every day. It was like basically an mm -hmm. F you to you as an advice columnist. When I got that question, I almost deleted it. I have a, a, a palpable memory of my finger on that delete key. And my impulse was immediately counteracted by that sense that, no, this guy was actually serious. He thinks he's joking, but he's serious. And so right. I'm going to answer him. I think I'm duty bound just to read a little bit of that response so people who are not familiar with uh, that column and the column in general can hear what you wrote. Because this kid says, WTF, WTF, WTF. And you, you write to him, dear WTF. My father's father made me jack him off when I was three and four and five. I wasn't any good at it. My hands were too small and I couldn't get the rhythm right and I didn't understand what I was doing. I only knew I didn't want to do it, knew that it made me feel miserable and anxious in a way so sickeningly particular that I can feel that same particular sickness rising this very minute in my throat. That is the moment where I was like, okay, and I, maybe you feel the same way, Stephen. It was like Cheryl wasn't just trying to shock this kid into greater compassion. That was certainly happening, I think. But she was actually announcing, you were announcing your mission as Sugar. You were saying, look, inexplicable sorrow waits for you, young punk. And, you know, life isn't some narcissistic game that you play online. It all matters. Every sin, every regret, every affliction. And here's the proof. 
You know, this happened to me and life is real. It was absolutely subverted what we think of as an advice column where you're essentially saying to this kid who's doing everything he can to not take himself seriously Mm -hmm. and his anguish. But, of course, he wrote to you and he was waiting and some cavern of his heart was waiting for you to respond to him as dismissive as he thought he was being. And you did answer him and you told him the fuck is your life. Answer it. So that, I think, should be one of our mission statements as well. Yeah, is answering it, standing up and facing your demons and your ghosts and celebrating your glories and joys and, you know, all of that, the full range of human complexity. We want that to be present here. Are you going to help us out with that, Mr. Elliot? (laughs) What can can I do to help? When we get stuck, we can maybe call you up. That question is going to come along. (laughs) Right. The the question is going to come along that has to do with BDSM protocol. And as much as Uh Cheryl and I dabble in the dark arts, you are our you are our expert. See, I was amazing. If I was like the special dark art correspondent, I'm like a a Howard Stern kind of character, but a a more modern (laughs) kind of (laughs) updated. You know, I did have this experience last week when I realized just how far my life has just gone in this other direction. You know, and I was writing about it. I was writing about you and other people, you know, who I've seen kind of like connect to like larger populations, you know. But I'll give you the very short, short version of it was that I found myself in a goth club last week in like six inch pink heels and a slip. And I'm just wondering, I'm sitting there, I'm like, I'm 42 years old and I'm, and I'm the guy in the goth club in a pink dress. And I'm like, how did it come to this? And I realized, you know, that I was actually getting weirder. Well, all my friends were finding places to connect, and I was getting stranger as I got older. Wow. And do, does that make you happy, or is that difficult for you? No, it's a disaster. It's yeah. a disaster, you know? I just feel like I'm literally getting further and further away, you know? I'm a flaming piece of pink cotton candy in a dark club. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I think the most interesting thing you said when you just described yourself to us in that moment was that you're 42 years old. And I do think that at different points in our lives, you know, it's our work to evolve. And what that means is you have to make your way through the different passages we each have in our lives. And, you know, you're in the midst of a passage. You know, you are entering middle age, but but you have refused to enter it. And, you know, you have to do whatever work it takes to move to that next place, Stephen. Mm -hmm. See, this is why you're good at this stuff. You have such a beautiful and inspiring way of looking at the world. (laughs) He can evolve, Cheryl, as you wish. He can evolve. And I know, actually, Stephen, that you're a writer. That's what you are. You're a crazy nutbag writer. So I'm Uh, less worried about you than you are, if that makes any sense. Steve (laughs) Allman was always the less nurturing sugar. That's right. Uh I was like, you seem like you're going to be fine. But I still want to give him the dark arts correspondent title. I like it. I think he needs a little (laughs) embossed card that he can slip into his brassiere before he goes into the gospel. So it's going to be a weekly show? A weekly show. We, you are officially included. It's too late for you. you you've already been Good. listed Family on the masthead. Good. All right. Well, I love you guys. And have a great show. We, we love, love you, you too. Bye. Bye. I mean, I swear to God, you know, if we could boil down all of the questions I received as Sugar, probably all the questions you received as well, they really do sort of boil down to one, which is, is it okay for me to be me? Right. And I think people are shocked to know that other people feel that way, too. One of the things I learned as sugar is everyone feels like the outsider, even people who you would never guess, like they seem like the most insider person ever. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so the show is about what truly lives on the inside, not the public face, but the private self. And, you know, with you on the radio, I want to really dig into that. And we're going to use ourselves in the course of that. We're going to use our friends and our spouses and our parents and our histories, our children. No one is safe. No one is safe. And, you know, I know that by doing that, and I know you have written about yourself in very vulnerable ways, too. I mean, the thing we always fear is condemnation and judgment and being further excluded, right? Right. But what's happened always over and over again in my own life as both a human and a writer is the opposite. People say, he didn't stop cheating on my mom. He didn't apologize. I love my dad and wish we had a better relationship, but I know that I have neither forgiven nor forgotten. So here I am, a 22-year-old recent graduate, stuck in a 13-year-old's painful past. I can't seem to move on or at least let go of the rage I have for my dad. I don't want to be mad and broken anymore. Does he deserve my forgiveness? 
Can we ever have a relationship built on something other than anger? Yours, wanting to move on. Well, you know, the question that is right at the center of that is, does my dad deserve my forgiveness? And I think the verb is the interesting thing. Does he deserve my forgiveness? This is a young woman who is treating forgiveness as something that's transactional, Mm -hmm. as something that somebody has to earn. But, of course, forgiveness is something you bestow without any expectation that it's going to be returned. Mm -hmm. And what I hear underneath that is, you know, she says, my dad didn't care enough to even think of protecting his family. The way of looking at it, and she can't look at it, she's not there yet, he was too weak. And that might be more difficult to face even than a philandering father or a careless father, heedless father. The beautiful thing, though, about this letter, I mean, I'm actually filled with hope reading this letter Hmm. because I feel like this is somebody standing on the very edge of, like, entering the next part of her life, you know, the next part of her ability to uh, come to terms with her childhood. Like, we all have to do it about that age. You know, she's 22. This is the age where you're like, okay, that... That childhood I had, it was mine, and it contained all these good things and all these bad things, and what sense do I make of it? And, you know, for how much longer can I continue to blame my parents for the things they did? Right. And um, my personal role is like 30. You can blame your parents for your problems until you're 30, and then it's over. Um, so she's gotten a nice eight years to, to come to terms with this. <laughs> to and, and, she can, and she can. I mean, what's beautiful is I feel so much sympathy, you know, for her pain and her rage. She should feel that way. Like we can go back to the ancients. We can go back to like Greek mythology and, you know, the, 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 the various gods and goddesses, you know, like written about and the, the kind of essential primal rage we have at sexual betrayal, um, the father failing to, to be the hero. You know, there's a gender dynamic here. You know, like she needs him to be a faithful man so that she can believe in faithful men. That's right. Okay. I think that that was w- what I think moving forward is that it's an issue of trust. And she feels that her trust in the ability to even you know, put her faith in a relationship has been undermined because she had a father who she thought was one kind of person growing up in a household with a marriage she thought was on solid ground. And not only was there an episode of infidelity, but it was chronic. And she was the person who opened that particular portal of unhappiness. Yeah. You know, we know from Anna Karenina, all was tumult in the Oblonsky's house. You know, it's Mm -hmm. all about the way in which infidelities and ultimately that kind of deceit filters down and infiltrates the whole family system. The whole household breaks down. So I think probably moving forward, understandably, she's sitting there saying, how is it that I'm ever supposed to have trust? in the possibility of a successful monogamous relationship and trying to hang that concern or the, the blame for that on her father, saying, you right. really, it's impossible for me now to do this. Right. Absolutely. Well, and I think, you know, I'm just so curious about her relationship with her father. She has one. Why not say, you know what, now that I'm a grown-up and able to have this conversation with you, will you please talk to me right. about why you cheated on mom. You know, maybe he'll shut down and and all those things that we hope won't happen. But but maybe he'll he wants to have that opportunity to say sorry. I would guess that this guy is sorry. Oh yeah. I would guess that he feels acutely that he failed his daughter, even if he couldn't keep himself from failing. I think his silence in the matter is proof of the fact that the feelings of guilt and remorse and so forth are overwhelming. You know, it's sort of the still waters run deep. It's hard to say to somebody, especially somebody who identifies as a child, like, hey, listen, your dad feels a lot of love for you. And in fact, he feels so much love for you that it's crushing to his sense of self to know that he disappointed you and on some level you hate him. And also even more devastating that maybe his transgressions are visited upon you in the form of mistrust that Mm -hmm. you won't be able to find a happy relationship. That's a horrible burden. After all, parents are trying to make sure that their kids do better than they did Mm -hmm. to not repeat their sins. And I think if she does talk with her dad, it needs to be with the expectation that he might not be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, she's 22. When you were 22, Uh. what were you going through with your parents? I mean, I think so many of us in our 20s, it is when we turn back. And, you know, we were in our childhoods and our adolescence. We were so in it, we, we couldn't perceive anything outside of, like, that was reality. Okay. Then you step out into the world 
and you can see that you had a unique childhood. You had a yeah. unique life, you know, and then you, you, you start to, uh, there's a, a lot, I think rage is a really common feeling for people at that age. What was happening for you when you were 22 with your parents? How did you, did you think that they had done a good job at that point or were you angry at them? Uh, I think I always felt just in my unique family system, I always felt that I was sort of the protector of my parents and my assigned role, even though I was a mess and was messing up every possible relationship I could. And in fact, when I was 22, I was cheating on my girlfriend Mm -hmm. because I was weak and I had a concept, you know, I had the feeling as men do when you feel deep down self-loathing and insecure. Well, how do you cure that? Well, you try to have sex with a lot of women. That'll Mm -hmm. take care of it. But, you know, that's what I was doing. I was messing up my relationships and my brothers were the ones who were very angry at my folks. And I was kind of trying to defend them. Over the years as I've gotten older, I've been able to recognize they were flawed in certain ways that still affect me and still haunt me. I still am carrying around the ghost of my mother's anxiety. I see her and, you know, the state she'll get in about little things and how big they become inside her. And I just go, oh, my God, that's me. Mm -hmm. That's where it comes from. We all have that feeling. What's interesting is that she absorbed this betrayal at a particular moment. Uh, I mean, 13 years old, that's a time when you absolutely are going to find fault with your parents in this huge way. Mm -hmm. Everything they do, every little transgression is giant. Now imagine that you're the person who walks in on the secret life of your father. Imagine how hugely magnified that is within the psyche and the emotional state of a 13-year-old. That's the tragedy. We think of our parents, they're gods. That's where the idea of God comes from, especially the idea of our fathers. We have the fantasy that they're perfect, that they're Mm -hmm. infallible, and that they're all-powerful. And when they betray that, especially in as dramatic a way as this, it's absolutely crushing. Mm -hmm. You know, so I I feel for her, but I also recognize she's not going to be able to move forward until she stops allowing him, giving him that kind of psychic power, because that's what she's doing. Yeah, I I think... So often what we come to is these, these, you know, people who write us letters say, I'm stuck. But what they've done in the very act of writing a letter has gotten themselves a little bit unstuck. Right. You know, there is movement forward by see, you know, what you do is you, you have to seek. I think, you know, forgiveness, this idea of forgiveness is at the center of this question. Mm-hmm. And it is the only way out. You know, even though I'm advocating for communication, for her trying to build a greater intimacy with her father, you know, in their living relationship, I agree with you that the most important work to be done is, you know, basically her talking to herself about healing this wound that was created by her father's actions. The hard thing is that you have to do all the work. And the beautiful thing is you get to do all the work. Exactly. So you're not relying on somebody else to do it for you. Yeah. You know, I have a tremendous father wound. You know, I had a terrible father and never, never was he, you know, the, that loving, distant presence in my life that you just described, like the godlike figure. He was, he was the god of destruction. Um, in my first years of my life, he was, you know, violent and tyrannical and abusive to my mother and, you know, committed cr- crimes, you know, things that, that uh, many people would think are unforgivable. And... The only way that I could survive and thrive and evolve as a human is to come up with a way to forgive him without his permission or cooperation. Right. Now, at different points throughout my life, I tried to engage him. You know, I tried to see if he could be the father I wanted him to be, and he he never could. But after a certain point, I did when I was about 22. Well, I was 22 when my mom died, you know, and that is when I really thought if I am going to have a good life, I need to come up with a way to heal this wound and to forgive my father for his failings, Yeah, you know, she... large as they were. And so I can say to this, this letter writer, you know, that this is really possible. And I know so many people who are hearing these words right now, you know, they have had to do that. You know, many, many of us have had to come to grips with parents who who failed us in ways large and small. That's part of what it means to grow up. And I think that for me, part of doing that work has to do with also like reconceiving what we mean by forgiveness. It's not one act at one time. It's not one decision. It's not one, you know, like day where you 
have an epiphany and then and then all of your sorrow and rage is gone. Right. It's years. It's it's decades. It's decades right. of saying here I am and you might have been a dark teacher, but you were a teacher. Hmm. And thank you. Yeah. Could be used as a window into the interior life. This life that people were all around me trying to keep concealed. That's right. And when I was a kid, you know, I was always just very curious to an extent that was, you know, embarrassing to the adults around me. When my mom's friends would come over, she would say to me, okay, Cheryl, you can ask three questions. That's it. Like she would have to put a limit because I would sit there and I would grill them. And one of the questions that I would often ask if a couple came over, I would say to them, why do you really love each other? Yeah. I wanted the real story, just like what you said. You know, I wanted I wanted what was beneath. I wanted what was not apparent. So what about you, Steve? Like, what's your background with therapy? Yeah, yeah you, my background with therapy. God, I'll show you my bills. I mean, I absolutely, it was a family religion. I mean, I grew up with parents who were psychiatrists and then psychoanalysts. And people, the reaction is so interesting when I tell people this. The first thing people say is, oh, you must be crazy. Every single person I talk to says, oh, you must be so crazy, as if somehow if if I said my parents were firemen, they would think I was a a pyromaniac. I think it makes people feel indicted in some way, like psychiatrists or therapists or people who can see things that other people can't see, and it gives you this kind of dark clairvoyance or something. The truth of the matter is just the opposite, that I had no idea what my parents did. They never talked about their patients. It was mysterious to me. All I knew was that they came home very drained and that there wasn't a lot of emotional and psychological discourse in our house. Mm. People think that there was some analytic couch, you know, in the living room and that they'd say, oh, well, that's very interesting, son. I think maybe my fantasy was that that would happen. But we didn't talk a lot about emotion and psychology. And it was an unrequited desire, just like you as a little kid saying, I want to get to the bottom of this. There are all these secrets that people are keeping and I want them out in the open. I've always been reaching after that. And when I found fiction and the possibility after being a journalist and asking these external questions, who, when, where, you know, I started reading and realizing, wait a second, the most interesting questions are why? The most interesting forms of bewilderment are loss and regret. Why do we choose the wrong people? Why do we make, you know, bad decisions that are hurtful to us? Why can't we hold on to love that feels so precious? Why do we carry around guilt and rage? And, you know, all these questions that were questions that feel to me like, what's the point of being on earth Mm -hmm. if you're not going to try to unearth this stuff? I think in a weird way, it's like my homage to my parents. I think that's why, for me, I was drawn to the advice column as as a concept But even it was especially important for me to see the work that you did and to say, oh, wow, you know, that's really the way to do it. You've got to lay yourself bare in order to fully immerse yourself in somebody else's anguish, what they're going through, and give them any sort of clarity or at least make them comfortable in the doubt of their circumstance. So that's the exciting part for me. You know, let's hear what comes in across the transom. Let's hear what people are struggling with, the real story, and, you know, see what we can do to help. Last Scene, a new podcast from WBUR in the Boston Globe, investigates the largest unsolved art heist in history. So about the time that he begins putting the duct tape on, he says, this is a robbery. The theft of half a billion dollars worth of art from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. When the FBI says, we solved it, we know who did it, it's like, no, you don't, because you don't have the paintings. Subscribe and listen to Last Scene Now on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Sponsored by Samuel Adams and ADT Smart Home. I'm Michelle Goldberg. I'm Ross Douthat. And I'm David Leonhardt. We're the hosts of The Argument, a new podcast from the New York Times opinion section. These days, it's more important than ever to listen to people who disagree with you. Maybe they'll teach you something new. Or maybe they'll just teach you how to beat them. So listen to The Argument from The New York Times. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen. Dear Sugar, I'm writing you because I am absolutely stuck. I have been blessed with an amazing husband and two gorgeous children. But here's my problem. My husband wants a third. I'm a working mother and my husband works long hours 
so I can't depend on him to be around when the kids come home from school. And as it is between work and trying to be involved in their schools and lives and running a household, I already feel like I'm failing. I try to imagine doing all those things while stopping to feed a baby or change a diaper, and it seems impossible. Even though I know it is possible, it seems unappealing. When I see other people with babies, I think about how I cannot imagine being back in that stage, how hard it was, and how I'm so happy that it's not my baby. On a more selfish note, I got married young. Then we both went straight to grad school, and I graduated already pregnant, but had to start working. There's a part of me that finally feels like I'm able to have a little freedom and time to myself. I'm able to read books again, work out again, albeit at 5.30 in the morning. And on some days, I actually feel human again. I do like the idea of the kids being more independent when my husband and I are still young enough to enjoy ourselves and spend time doing activities or traveling, something that we've never been able to do. But just as I think all these things, and it seems clear, there's a small part of me that feels like I'm taking the easy way out, that feels like my hardest decisions have been the most wonderful. And I ask myself if I'll regret it later. I just need some direction, sugar. Please. Sincerely, Stuck. Steve, what do you think? Oh, boy. I have a third child, and we had a very complicated path to deciding or winding up with a third child. I don't know how much conscious decision-making we did, but a lot of unconscious and conscious struggling with it. And I feel for this woman deeply, but I also think she knows the answer. You know, she's a working mom, but she has to run the household, and she also knows that her husband's not going to be around when the kids come home from school. So it's easy for a dad to say, I want a third baby, absolutely, because he's going to be doing, what would you say, 20, 25 percent, 30 percent of the work? Probably less than that if we're truly, deeply honest. Mm -hmm. And this woman wants her life back, and she wants a sense of identity, and yet she's plagued by the feeling that those desires are selfish. Isn't that interesting? That's, that's one of the most interesting parts of the letter for me. And, I, and you hear it a lot, too, just at large. You know, women who don't choose to become mothers are somehow selfish or women who don't have that third baby. How can that be selfish? I think we've been guilt tripped for so long to be the nurturers, to be the mothers, even, if, even when we aren't mothers or don't want to be, that we equate independence or agency or a sort of intellectual decision about what you'd actually like to do with your life. Right with being self-absorbed or being selfish. I think that's absolutely incorrect. Right. And the, the categorical assumption about women is that they should want to be mothers and that mothers should be entirely selfless, that they should be defined as human beings who, the moment they become impregnated, are living for somebody else. And it is one of the most destructive myths. It's sort of the crime that dare not speak its name is maternal ambivalence. What I would say is that maybe we should expand the conversation because so many people you have, I certainly did, struggled with the question. I think it's worth talking to my wife about this because I think we should call her up. Oh, gosh. She's got three kids. There's no way she can answer this phone. Yeah, and where are you? And you're being very helpful, aren't you, Steve? Typical. I imagine her swabbing the bottom. Hi, of... you've reached Aaron Allman. Please ah, leave me a message. Damn it, Aaron. I will get back to you as soon as I can. Where is Aaron? I know exactly where Aaron is. Aaron is dealing with a not quite colicky, but deeply tyrannical 15 month old. She's got a five year old who's probably fighting with her eight year old daughter. I know exactly why she can't pick up that phone. Well, I think that we should call my husband because. We fell on the other side of this question, Mm -hmm. you know, for the same reasons that you and Aaron decided to have a baby, you know, that we we were very drawn to this idea of just that big love that you have when you have a baby. It's there's nothing like it. It's the best thing we've ever done is have our children. And so we thought, well, why not more? And we decided not to. Um, and, <laughs> having and, and said all that. Having said all that. So let's let's call my husband and talk about what, what we came up with. Hello. Hi, sweetie. Hey, hon. So Steve and I 
have a question from a listener. Okay. And she and her husband are thinking about a third child. Her husband is in favor of it. And she's slightly open to it, but mostly what she reports is a lot of doubt and reluctance. Mm -hmm. You and I have our two beautiful kids, but we did have a conversation about having a third. Do you remember? I do remember. Yes. (laughs) Was that you? That was me. (laughs) So would you share with us your thoughts about, you know, why did you want to have one? Why did we entertain that possibility so deeply and seriously? And why did we decide not to? Well, uh, as I recall, we were very open to it and excited by it, but we were also a little bit intimidated just by how kind of far stretched we we felt. I think more so than like coming to a decision not to have one, we rolled the dice and, you know, kind of let the universe decide whether or not we would have the third, you know. Well, what do you mean? Well, I mean, we weren't using birth control and we had that time where we thought you were pregnant. Well, but we, I know that was a sort of mistake. I mean, the time, <laughs> see, <laughs> you, you, will, you will remember, no, you <laughs> will remember. So here's what happened. So, you know, our kids were toddlers and we were hardly ever having sex with each other because we were so consumed with the care of the kids. And remember, we went on vacation and we were staying in this cabin with the kids in Minnesota. And I had this idea. Do you remember what the idea was? I can't to have sex? Every single day. <laughs> <laughs> it was to have sex, remember, every day. That's like the greatest yeah, idea you've ever had. And so our vacation was... I love, the, I love your ideas, huh? <laughs> and every day we were like, okay, we have to have sex. And wasn't that fun? It was great. It was so fun. And I had done all of this sort of looking at my cycle and stuff, and I said, not only are we going to have sex every day for like the next 10 days, we're also completely safe because of like where I am in my cycle. And then remember we were like driving... <laughs> away. And I was like, you know what? And I was like looking up the calendar and I said, I think I actually miscalculated just by like a few days. Yeah. And this is when we were like, oh my gosh. And then this started this whole conversation. Well, should we, should we not? Now would be the moment to do it if we're going to do it. Cause I was just about to turn 40. We could also say maybe in some ways I was asking for it. You know, I don't feel that I was, but, but maybe in some ways I was, but, but then after that, we decided not I, to. I think, I think it does qualify having sex every night with your husband for a week <laughs> without birth control. 10 days. Ten, ten days. Oh, my God. You know, <laughs> I think that does actually qualify as leaving it up to the universe. Yeah, I guess. So. <laughs> but, you know, but then we got conscious about it. And then and then we we, we weren't when I but, thought I was pregnant and then didn't want to be. I was a lot more careful after that. What did you hope when we thought that I was pregnant? What were you hoping for? I was hoping you were pregnant. Yeah. Wow. Uh, but I also felt kind of just like in the warm embrace of the universe and felt like, you know, whatever transpires will be fine. Well, and, what, and I think, gift. what I think is interesting, I remember that's that's where it was like a wake up call for me because I was aware that you were hoping I was pregnant and I was terrified that I was pregnant and I was hoping I wasn't pregnant. Wow. And I think that, you know, then we sat down and we did this whole thing. We made this long list of all the reasons we should not have a third and then a list of the reasons we should. And there was only one thing on the list in favor of having a child and oodles of things on the other list. But, you know, I did think that it really showed our hand that you were rooting for me being pregnant and I was rooting against it. Even though a part of me wanted to be pregnant, most of me didn't. And it had to do with, I just remember very literally thinking I had been in the slow lane. You know, we had two kids who were 18 months apart, which also coincided with my career you know, really taking off. My first book was published when our second was a newborn. And I remember, you know, feeling like I was like running a race with like one of my legs tied to, you know, a bucket. And I I couldn't run as fast as the people around me professionally. And obviously I did that, you know, happily. I was so, you know, being a mother is the best thing ever. But I was also, I felt, you know, hindered in some ways. And I was like, okay, am I willing to stay in the slow lane for another couple of years, which is what it would be if we'd had that third child. But I think it would be important for you to share what that one thing was on the list for reasons to do it. Because it's the best thing we ever did in our whole lives. (laughs) Exactly. It was because we love them beyond measure. 
and it was enough, you know, and then on the list of not to, we can't afford it. We can't, you know, it's all, all of, you know, and the main one, the number one reason not to was that we were going to have to buy a minivan. (laughs) Did you buy a minivan, Steve? We did not buy a minivan. We, in fact, bought a Prius and we spent about, I'm going to say, 157 hours trying to figure out what configuration of car seats could fit three right. in the back of a Prius. That was our problem. Like we just, we were like, we, we'd have to buy, we'd, we'd honestly have to buy a new car yeah. if we had a third baby. I'll tell you what's so fascinating. I remember when Erin broke the news to me. I remember two things as you were talking, Cheryl. When she told me that she was pregnant, we, you know, you guys made a list. We didn't make a list. We were really flying by the seat of our pants, not paying very careful attention. And I'm still foggy on the whole mechanics of how babies are made, frankly. <laughs> so uh, I, I remember quite distinctly she showed up. She w- walked into the doorway of my office and she had a look on her face of just a kind of queasy terror. And I said, what's going on? And she said, uh, well, the good news is we don't have to worry about birth control for the next nine months. And then, I mean, she was trying to make a joke, but she just burst into tears. She was so worried about what my reaction was going to be because it wasn't something that we'd planned. And I, you know, I I gave her a hug, but I also was absolutely panicked and really grief stricken because what I felt, and this speaks to my selfishness, but also to my need, was I'm going to lose my wife again. Mm -hmm. I'm going to lose my wife again. I also remember about four or five months in when Aaron was, you know, nauseous and unhappy and we were fighting and our kids were picking up on the tension. And I remember us having a fight one night and uh, I just remember saying to her, look, this is either going to break us or it's going to bring us closer together. Those are the two choices here. Either this third baby that we did not plan for, even though secretly each of us in our own ways might have wished for it, is either going to going to blow us apart, the pressure of it, or it's going to bring us closer together. Mm-hmm. I think it's brought us closer together, but this woman is, she is thinking the right things. She gets that it's not just going to be the romantic part of it. It's a real thing that is going to completely take her away from the the goals that she has. It, as beautiful as it is, that, that one item, it's the best thing we ever did, is on every single expecting parents list. Right. No matter how many kids they have. Yeah. They always have that on. I'm not to trying to trivialize it. It is the most profound thing that human beings can do. I feel it's the most emotionally and psychologically involved, but it's not the only thing they do. And it's not something that everybody has to do or a certain number of times. This woman seems very in control of the fact, in a way, frankly, that Aaron and I were not, of her circumstances and the life that she wants to lead and has a right to lead. Yeah. Well, and I think, too, you know, in very practical terms, because we didn't have that third baby at that moment in our lives, what else we were doing during that time? I was writing wild. Yeah. And I then giving birth to was sugar. Giving birth to sugar and writing the sugar column. Brian was making his most recent documentary, Alien Boy. Yep. Our kids were, you know, toddlers and preschoolers at this point. Right. We were struggling for money and taking every job we could possibly take to pay the rent. And then we were also both undertaking huge artistic projects for which the outcome was absolutely unknown. But here's to me for this, this letter. The thing that concerns me the most is, is the feeling that she conveys um, of, of not kind of the parenting being equal. Right. And it just seems like their whole situation uh, is going to become very altered because he would have to be the main parent in many ways while she's pregnant and, and you know, having the child. And, and I'm, I'm kind of worried about that, that equation. Right. I mean, even Steve and Aaron, you know, you have a equitable relationship, but Aaron is with the kids more than you are. Absolutely. As, as, as was just demonstrated, there's a couple of things I'll say. I think the fundamental problem or the thing that was most unsettling about this woman's letter is the line when she says, I already feel like I'm failing. Yeah. And what I would say to her is you're not failing. You're succeeding wildly. You're a very cognizant, present parent. You're concerned about the right things. You probably need to renegotiate the terms of your marriage a little bit so that you're under less pressure and feel less guilty about wanting to actually have an identity outside of being a mom. She has the right to do that and to not feel like a failure because she's doing about three different jobs at the same time. We obviously can never 
tell anyone to have a kid or not have a kid. That's, you know, a decision. But I think it's really useful to have these kind of discussions. I think that, you know, we're supposed to this idea, especially of motherhood, is about purity and clarity and love and all of those things. But really, there's so much ambivalence. And there isn't one right path. Brian, do you have any regrets about um, our decision not to have a third? No, um, I, I just feel so, you know, lucky to have the two, and also that uh, my plate's more than full. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say I, my regret was, you know, if if I had more time, I would probably have a third. If I were younger right now, I would right. maybe say, hey, let's have another baby. Um, but that's just not how life is. And and one of the beautiful things about life is loving the things that you've had to let go. You know, there's this column I wrote as Dear Sugar, the ghost ship that doesn't carry us, you know, that it's about waving to that ship that you're not aboard um, and acknowledging that there's beauty on it and you're not there for it. But because you're not there for it, you're there for another kind of beauty. So whether you have zero kids or one kid or three kids or ten kids, there's just a different version of love in your life. Yeah, and we look at couples like you guys and go, oh, that was the other life that we were going to lead. Yeah, exactly. Okay, sweetie, I'll be home later, and we can start our first of 10 days. (laughs) It should be 15 days. 15, okay. Thanks for talking to us, Mr. Sugar. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Bye. All right. Dear Sugar, I've fallen in love with a guy who is perfect except that he is not my intellectual equal. He's nice, caring, and everything a person would want. But deep in my heart, I don't see myself marrying him, and I know our relationship has an expiration date. His family is blue-collar, mine is affluent and educated. He's not ambitious and is happy to spend the rest of his life in the same job. I want to make my mark in the world. I feel shallow and conflicted. I really love him and am happy with him. Is it possible to have a fulfilling life with someone when you do feel an economic and intellectual divide? How important is it to overcome that divide? Signed, trying to play it smart. Hmm. Now, I did not pick this question because you are clearly so much more intelligent than me, (laughs) but I did pick this question. What do you think, Cheryl? I think it's interesting. I think a lot of different things about it. Because it's fascinating to me the the ways that this letter writer chooses to define um, the things that divide her from her partner. Right. She says she's happy. She says she loves him. Right. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah. A guy Isn't that enough? He, he's perfect. You know, yeah. And so then she seems to have enough in common with him that she's fallen in love with him, right? And they've sustained a relationship to the point that they're in love. And yet she's immediately based on these kind of very, I think kind of surface markers, um, just decided that they're not compatible, that he's not the one. And so she's she's doing this. It's almost like we could write a romantic comedy, you know, <laughs> like we could just write the screenplay right now and sell it like in 10 seconds to Hollywood. Great. Because you know how the story is going to end I just in wrote, Hollywood. I just wrote the ending. Okay. Yeah. She's going to dump him. Yep. Then she's going to marry some, you know, asshole, you know, who's like, like her, you know. And she's going to be miserable, but wearing like, you know, Prada and, you know, all this stuff. And she's going to be like in a bookstore one afternoon and she's going to look up and there he is. He's not ambitious. He's just like a clerk in this independent bookstore. Right. And she's going to realize the mistake that she made. I don't know. You know, I think in Hollywood they would cheese it up and he somehow would have improved himself. You know, he would, uh, you know, be going to community college and ready to take a career seriously. Or fundamentally, no. you know because, what it be? He, he would appear to be like working class, right. but actually he's like the, the you know, he's like the inherits right. a great well, like he's like a Rockefeller, you know. Because uh, only, honestly, a lot of what this question is about, and what Hollywood will never deal with in a million years, is class. Yeah, I mean, it's about respect and it's about class. She doesn't respect this guy. Yeah, she's a snob. She's a snob. She's a snob. Now, listen, uh, everybody's a snob. I'm a snob. Everybody's a snob. In their are you own saying way. I'm a snob? No, other than you. Everybody else is a snob, Cheryl. <laughs> I, I, I'm a snob about certain things. Okay, <laughs> exactly. I'll admit. I mean, you're a snob in saying I would never buy a minivan. 
You that's, know, that's true. That's your kind of snob. You, true. We all carry around our bigotries. In, but in, I like a lot of people who drive minivans. Sure. You just wouldn't want to own one yourself. That's it's right. Okay. But the truth is what I hear in this letter is somebody who's saying, well, I love this guy, but he's not good enough for me. Mm-hmm. He's not ambitious enough for me. I think intelligence is a crock. I think people are intelligent in all kinds of different ways. Like, for instance, emotional intelligence. Would you rather be with somebody who's a Mensa member or somebody who, like, really recognizes when you walk through the door at the end of the day that you're upset and you need some time on your own and maybe a hug? Like, come on, it's a no-brainer. So the idea of intelligence, is it's just a very slippery word to me. Mm -hmm. I think she might be. I don't want to be too hard on her, but I think she wants to believe that she could love such a person. Well, she does love such a person. She just thinks he's not a good match for a life partner. So which tells us she has other things in mind for a life partner aside from love. She has love. You know, that's one box to check. And then things like ambition and being in the same socioeconomic class and, you know, having the same aspirations in the material world. So she has many boxes that she wants to check. I think a lot of people do. I'm not condemning it. But I do think it's interesting that love is only one of those because she says she loves him and she's happy with him. She has no complaints. But I don't believe it. I mean, she says she has no complaints until she starts complaining, right? His family is blue collar. Mine is affluent and educated. He's not ambitious. He's happy to spend the rest of his life in the same job. I want to make my mark in the world. That's a fundamental grudge against his lack of ambition. And if she honestly feels that, great. But just be to thine own self, be true. Mm -hmm. Quit. Quit ultimately misleading him yeah. because she's in the position of power here. And, and you've seen this in every relationship. There's this power balance and it can, it can, the fulcrum can be different things. It can be sexuality. It can be beauty. It can be economic power. It can be a certain kind of class assurance. It can be ambition. But what's clear is she doesn't respect him. Mm -hmm. And if she can write to us a couple of relative strangers, that's just, come on, you don't want to lie down every night with somebody where you don't feel like you can be honest about how you, maybe she's told him that she feels all this about him, but I doubt it. Mm -hmm. I think he'd be heading for the door and saying, listen, I'm going to find a relationship where I'm more esteemed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I do think, you know, even though, you know, our first impulse is like, wait, she loves him and she's happy. They should be together. I, I agree with you. I think that you have to choose the partner you want to be with. You know, you can't be torturing yourself all the time saying, well, but he's this or she's that, you know. And, and I think that she might look back on right. this and, and, and realize that she was wrong. But I think that's a lesson that she actually has to learn through making those choices. Correct. But I will say, and I've written about this before, you know, I was married before. Mm-hmm. So I've been married twice. And one of the things that I'm so struck by is, you know, both of these men, my, my husband Brian and my ex-husband, um, they have a lot in common. They're very similar. They would like each other. If they knew each other, you would like my ex-husband. I mean, we have similar politics. We have similar interests. We have similar all kinds of things. I I think that I, you know, one of the main reasons my first marriage ended, you know, I was too young to be married and all these things. But really at this core level, in this root way, I felt a mismatch. And I, and I identify in some slight way with this letter writer. Um, It wasn't anything to do with like, I felt superior, inferior, but we came from different streams. He grew up, you know, sort of upper middle class. His parents were still married to each other. He had this on paper. He had a really nice life. His parents paid for his college education. Good pedigree. You know, I was from this broken home and, you know, scrapped my own way and had all of these, you know, um, you know, just had a different trajectory. Yep. When I met Brian, my husband, we immediately recognized each other. Right. We were both artists who grew up working class, raised by single mothers, and all, you know, absent, difficult fathers, all of these things that we had in common. And we, we immediately bonded over that feeling uh, that we had come from the same pond. Right. I can't overstate how powerful that is. And that's where I have real sympathy for this letter writer, because for whatever reason, if you don't feel it, it's not there. Right. In a relationship, that that sense of we were meant to be together is really important and really powerful. And so if you don't have it, that's why, you know, I'm a feminist. I couldn't be with somebody who had any trouble with feminism. Right. Uh, You know, all of these things that are really core to who I am, um, my partner has to, in some ways, if not fully accept those things, you know, and maybe even mirror them in himself. Or just respect them. Yeah. Fundamentally respect them. 
I do know relationships. I do know relationships, I will say, where, for instance, my friend Billy, he's married to a woman and he's super ambitious. And she is super ambitious as a mom. I think she's also a great visual artist, but she has the contract of their marriage is you need to be in the spotlight and my job is support staff. Mm -hmm. The contract with in my marriage with Aaron is more complicated. I'm in the, more in the spotlight, but I'm very desperate that she also find a place in the world for her art. And mm -hmm. I get that that is important. And if I don't respect that and esteem it, a lot of things are going to break. But it's also true that our friends, Billy and Katie, he's the star and she's okay with that. Every couple makes their own contract, yeah. I think. And the problem here is that she's not being honest in the contract that she wants and the person that she's with. Yeah. So the advice we can give her the best advice I always have to give anyone in any situation is you do have to trust your gut. You do have to listen to your truth. The body knows, and she is saying to us what she already knows to be true. She says, I love this guy, and there's an expiration date. So she needs to, you know, step into that, step into that truth, and then come what may. Here we are at the end of our first Dear Sugar Radio show, and I just feel like I've been through like the world's longest therapy session with you, Steve. Yes. I hope this show, our partnership, will be able to get across as, hey, we're all a mess. Like That's Dennis right. Dennis Johnson says, we're all a mess. <laughs> There's just some of us who wear it on our sleeves, yeah. and the rest of us just cover it up. You yeah. know, that's what you intuit as a seven-year-old. That's what I've seen all throughout my life. So let this be a place where the mess isn't celebrated, but it's at least we're, we're ready to dive in. You're not alone in it. And not to, you know, sit above it or offer judgment or, you know, condemnation or even to boss people around, but really say, well, what are you asking? And what does this bring up in me in my own life? Right. We've all... Uh, sometimes asked questions that we didn't realize we were asking. We got answers we didn't expect that, that changed our lives, that humbled us, that informed us. Yeah. So, you know, I look forward to doing that here on Dear Sugar Radio with you. Mm -hmm. What a great partner in this you are. But we can't do it alone.